Hey, welcome back to Well That's Interesting. The, my God, yes, that happens to me. Can you explain why? Edition? Today is episode, today is episode 175, Cute Aggression, or Why You Want to Strangle Adorable Things, and Eyelid Twitching. What's up with that? <laughs> my friends, has something similar to this happened to you recently, or ever at all? Say you're walking through a park, or down the street to your car or to the store, you're trapped in your own head, planning your day, imagining the mic drop moment to an argument that never occurred, basically just minding your goddamn business. And then suddenly, there's a puppy. Yes, there's a puppy, an incomprehensible blend of innocence and playfulness, an uncoordinated pile of flops and fluff. It's on a leash. Sure, but that cannot contain the short attention span of this tiny sneeze of a dog. You stop in your tracks. Your heart implodes a little and your face subconsciously contorts into an aww. And all you want to do, all you want to do is wrap it up in a burrito and eat it. Come on, admit it. You want to smush, crush, inhale, and just arr, 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 this adorable animal. Look, it happens to me all the friggin' time. It's almost embarrassing. Almost. And I say almost because this reaction, what's called cute aggression, is totally a thing. In fact, it's estimated 50 to 60% of us experience it. Yeah, you're not alone. And if you ever wondered why you want to simultaneously pet and figuratively smother something cute, today is your lucky day. Researchers have done a study on cute aggression, and we're going to squeeze the fuck out of it to understand why we're like this. I can't wait. Then after the break, I guarantee 99.9% .9 of us have felt this at one time or another. Eyelid twitching. Why? Why? This is one of those tiny life things that make you put your hands on your hips and say, what the fuck is this now? <laughs> yes, my blinky friends will be asking the question, why in the holy hell, out of seemingly nowhere, an eyelid will just spasm. We'll look into the mechanics that make it occur and what it means when your eye stops popping off. Don't, don't worry. Most of the time it's harmless. <laughs> then, of course, there's that 1% that makes it on a show like this. Hi. I'm Jill Chacha, by the way, and if this is your first time listening, welcome to The Flock, my 2020 business goose. To begin, I'm going to get you all riled up. And to do so, I'm going to need you to stop whatever it is you're doing, be it feeding a hungry child or copy and pasting from chat GPT. That's not important. If you're holding something that isn't your phone, you know the drill. Please drop it and ignore any screams. Pick up your phone and head on over to our social media stuffs. Tap on today's post and prepare yourself for three of the goddamn cutest creatures to ever fly, walk, and scamper on this hellbound earth. Now, what I'd like you to do is take a look at each photo and take note of how you feel emotionally, physically, what's happening to you mentally, okay? Are you ready? I'll give you a second. Okay, go. Welcome, welcome to the first goddamn image, which is not a puppy. No, what you're looking at is an orphaned bat slash flying fox wrapped in a blankie and being spoon fed. Mm -hmm. This is one of many cute sons of bitches saved by Denise Wade and others at Australia's Queensland Bat Conservation and Rescue. God damn it. Now. As urban development encroaches on the habitats of these uber-important pollinators, youngsters like this one can be separated from their mothers, and this is when Denise and the gang swoop in. Uh, fun fact, flying foxes are, of course, bats, but they don't use echolocation. They don't. They just use those big ears and big eyes. Fuck. <laughs> when you're ready to swipe through, God damn it, I've got another one for you. Uh, this is a screenshot from a video on the old tube of you. The video is called Master Forest Enjoys a Banana. Again, that's Master Forest Enjoys a Banana and you need to watch it immediately. Um, Forest is a flying fox and also a rescue and just so happened to be in a bad mood. So he was given a banana to eat and what you're seeing is his reaction and extremely full cheeks. 
are you infuriated with Glee? Do you not want to eat him like he's eating the banana? Don't lie to me. <laughs> well, we're not going to stop. Uh, please swipe on through one more time. Boom, baby sloth. Mm -hmm. Yep, what you're seeing is 100% real. It is not a stuffed animal. This is a baby male sloth who was rescued in Cincelejo, Colombia. And I am shattered. Um, God, and finally, and finally, if you haven't already thrown your phone against the wall because you just can't take, you just can't handle the cuteness, you might just do that after swiping through to our next and final photo. Behold, the least weasel. Yeah, I honestly don't know what to say. Um, this little fucker, this little fucker leaves me speechless. I'm paralyzed by its adorableness and... Because of this, I'm just going to read off some facts, okay? This is the smallest subspecies of weasel. I can't even speak. This is the smallest subspecies of weasel and the smallest living carnivore in the world. I will fucking say that again. The least weasel is the smallest living carnivore in the world. But despite growing to only four to ten inches in length, do not be fooled. They do not fuck around. Quote, According to Blackfoot legend, this species is the bravest of all animals, a hunter that is bold out of proportion to its size. Modern scientists agree with this view, as every single feature of these graceful, lightning-fast little animals appears to be designed so that they are the perfect predator." End quote. From Animelia.bio. God damn. If you can handle it, my shattered friends, please check out that site for more info and ridiculously cute photos of the least weasel. So, whew, let's regroup. How are you feeling? Happy and enraged? Good. That is cute aggression. And it's a term that has been recently coined and initially studied by researchers at Yale University back in 2015. Now, their study isn't our focus today. We're going to dive into an even more recent discovery in a moment, but I think we should just touch upon that 2015 paper as it's going to set us up for that. Okay. Oriana Aragon, who sounds like a character out of Game of Thrones. Oriana is actually an assistant professor at Clemson University and was part of the Yale team that gave the term its name. Aragon and the gang defined cute aggression as the urge some people get to squeeze, crush, or bite cute things, albeit without any desire to cause harm. They investigated this here phenomenon using pictures of baby humans and animals via an online survey, kind of like what you and I just did. Participants self-reported all their feelings and outward behaviors, and after all the clickety-clack calculations were done, a relationship between being overwhelmed by positive feelings and the expression of cute aggression was found. Now, get this, my completely normal business goose, this seemingly contradictory phenomenon actually fits quite snugly under an umbrella term called dimorphous expressions. Dimorphous expressions. We have them and show them all the goddamn time. Have you ever cried with laughter? Or laughed when nervous? Or punched the air in happiness? Yeah, me too. And as to why, there's one theory. Quote, we think that these dimorphous expressions, which come about only, it seems, in pretty intense emotional experiences, send a lot of information to onlookers as to what that person's emotional motivational state is. End quote. Said Aragon in the 2015 paper, Dimorphous Expressions of Positive Emotion, Displays of Both Care and Aggression in Response to Cute Stimuli. <laughs> A great title. So here we are, my equally adorable business goose. We have a behavioral explanation for our supposed wackiness. It's conveying information. But you may be asking, what, what's going on like on the inside? Like what parts of my brain are firing off for me to feel not only immense joy, but like the figurative urge to stuff, to stuff something into a taco? That is a great question. So Join me, will you, at the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Riverside. We just so happen to be standing next to a fellow cute aggressor and associate professor of psychology, Catherine Stravopoulos. 
Now, Catherine and her gang took cute aggression studies to the next level in 2018. They hooked up 54 adult participants, 20 males and 34 females, between the ages of 18 and 40 to EEG doodads. <laughs> now, the goal was to record the brain's responses to more than 100 images of humans and animals. And my friends, you need to hear how these pictures were grouped. It is fucking classic. Okay. From the 2018 study, quote... The current study had four blocks of trials, each containing different images. More cute baby animals, less cute adult animals, more cute babies, less cute babies. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> less cute babies. <laughs> now, if you're wondering how Catherine decided which human babies were cute and which weren't, <laughs> okay, she didn't, okay? Get this. The photos were, quote, morphed such that the more cute infants had more infantile characteristics, e.g. larger eyes, fuller cheeks, and in the less cute condition, they had less infantile characteristics, e.g. smaller eyes, less full cheeks. Note that the subjects of the photographs were the same in both the more cute baby and less cute baby conditions. The variation between them was in the morphing of the photographs. <laughs> and, and, quote, <laughs> but... Oh, so sadly, no one's child uh, was singled out as less cute. Sadly. <laughs> Sorry. Sadly. Okay. A little more about how the study was run. Uh, each participant saw, saw all photos in a random order, but each was seen four times. Between each stack of photos, participants were asked to complete a questionnaire indicating how they felt and what they felt while looking at all the cute and less cute children and animals. So, <laughs> what was discovered between the self-reporting and the EEG data? Drumroll, please. Thank you in the back. Quote, perhaps unsurprisingly, participants' brains showed more activity when they were looking at the cuter images. But what, but what was more interesting was precisely where that activity was being seen. When the subject under the EEG felt more acute aggression, there were two particular areas of the brain that lit up. The emotion center, which responded to the cuteness initially, but also the reward center. End quote from Dr. Katie Spaulding of IFL Science. So what in the holy hell does this mean? Well, I'm glad you asked that too. Not only are you feeling all the feels, my feely business goose, but the reward portion of your brain is popping off too. In sum, you and your brain are fucking overwhelmed. And to bring you back down to earth, quote, scientists suspect that's why the brain starts producing aggressive thoughts. The idea is that the appearance of these negative emotions help people get in control of the positive ones running amok. It could possibly be that somehow these expressions help us to just sort of get it out and come down off that baby high a little faster. End quote, said Oriana Aragon to NPR News. Huh, so my friends, it could be the brain's way of hitting the brakes. The urge to burrito something is actually a form of self-control, believe it or not. And uh, as for the folks who don't feel cute aggression, they're psychopaths. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> For people without this cute aggression response, it's possible they have other ways to cope when looking at a least weasel, or maybe they simply don't feel these emotions as intensely as we do. Which is a shame, I think. I wouldn't trade my urge to kill for anything. If you know, you know. <laughs> After the break, we're moving from the brain to the eyes and a very, very different sensation. Things are taking a turn next. So please, stay tuned. Hello, everyone. You may recognize me as Gabby from the History of Everything podcast. And my name is Bruna, and you don't recognize me from anything yet. Together, we're two scientists who explore all of the weird little questions and conspiracies of the universe in our new podcast, Mystery of Everything. Everything has an explanation. We hope. But that is what we're here to figure out. We will dive into the science behind many popular conspiracy theories, such as vaccines causing autism, flat earth theory, and was the moon landing fake? And if so, why the heck would anyone even do that? 
But it's not just conspiracies. There's a lot of cool mysteries that we will attempt to use science to explain, such as near-death experiences, what made the Vikings go berserk, and can I control my co-host with MK Ultra? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, make sure to check out the Mischief Everything podcast everywhere where you find your podcasts. When Johann Rahl received the letter on Christmas Day, 1776, he put it away to read later. Maybe he thought it was a season's greeting and wanted to save it for the fireside. But what it actually was, was a warning, delivered to the Hessian colonel, letting him know that General George Washington was crossing the Delaware and would soon attack his forces. The next day, when Rawl lost the Battle of Trenton and died from two colonial Boxing Day musket balls, the letter was found, unopened in his vest pocket. As someone with 15,000 unread emails in his inbox, I feel like there's a lesson there. Oh well, this is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the bad ideas, mistakes, and accidents that misshaped our world. Find us at constantpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. We are so back. And my friends, I hate to do this to you. Especially after binging photos of baby bats and baby sloths, and of course, photos of the itty bitty least weasel, aka the tiniest, cutest killer you ever did see, I'm afraid we're coming to an abrupt halt with the cute. And uh, I'm gonna need you to prepare for the next photo I'm about to present. You won't be able to unsee it, no pun intended, um, but it's necessary as it will help us understand this part of the show. So please head on back to our social media stuffs and tap on today's post. Once you're able to get past the gauntlet of animals, you'll come face to face with a digital rendering of a skull with no face and only eyeballs. <clears throat> it, it's a lot. It's a lot. And believe it or not, this is the least terrifying image I could find to help illustrate the orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis oculi. Now, for those very lucky business geese who are oh so busy and your hands are oh so full that you can in no way take a peek at what I'm talking about, um, I'm going to do my best to describe this to you. Okay. <clears throat> Imagine your head. Perfect. Okay. Now, remove everything but your eyeballs. You're doing great. Okay. Now, around each of your eyeballs, I want you to draw a big old circle around each one. Okay, now the right one. Okay, lovely. Now fill in those circles with pink tissue. Voila, the orbicularis oculi. <laughs> Round of applause. Now that we're all equally traumatized, let's explain what in the holy hell it does and why it's actually really important. According to the National Institutes of Health, the orbicularis oculi is actually a sphincter muscle. Yes, you have a sphincter muscle in your face, tell all your friends, and it's arranged in concentric bands around the upper and lower eyelids. Uh, it's made of three sections, and fun fact, the palpebral portion, palpebral portion, close enough, this part acts involuntary, and it's why we blink. And the orbital portion is what's controlled consciously, like when you wanna shut your eyes. Now, every now and then, this muscle goes a bit kooky. That's what I like to call it. But the official name when this happens is eyelid spasms or eyelid myokemia, which according to Christina Corin of the New York Times is involuntary and intermittent contractions of the eyelid, typically the lower one, end quote. Now, odds are if you're human, this probably has happened to you. And good news, it's more like your body just being annoying than actually anything wrong with it. So what can I say? Sometimes your body is just a jerk. End quote. Sorry, quote. <laughs> I guess you can quote me on that. <laughs> now we're moving on to a quote. Quote, eyelid spasms, while annoying, are rarely a sign of something serious, said Stephanie Irwin, an optometrist at Cleveland's Clinic Cole Eye Institute to the New York Times. If the twitching persists for a long period of time or is accompanied by additional symptoms, it's a good idea to be checked out by an eye doctor to make sure nothing else is going on." End quote. Put a pointy pin in that last part for now. 
we will get back to that. Let's start with the quote, rarely a sign of something serious part. Well, if you've ever felt this, you've probably, you've probably noticed only one eye is affected at a time. And that's because that goddamn twitch originates in the muscle surrounding the eye, not the nerve that controls the blink reflex, which is a message that is sent to both eyes simultaneously. So, why in the holy hell does this seemingly random spasm occur for a few minutes or on and off for a few days? Well, drum roll please. Thank you. Quote, nobody knows exactly why, said Dr. Alice Lorch, an ophthalmologist at Massachusetts Eye and Ear to the Times. Thanks. Okay, the Lorch also added, it could be initiated by a number of factors, from a small irritation, like a contact lens rubbing up against the eyelid, or more fun things such as stress, lack of sleep, or excessive caffeine. And get this, my squinty business goose, even reading. Yes, fucking reading may trigger it. Get this, according to a 2017 study titled Changes in Blink Rate and Ocular Symptoms During Different Reading Tasks, why yes, quote, both the blink rate and ocular discomfort symptoms were strongly affected during performance of close visual tasks. End quote. So what the fuck does that mean exactly? And what tasks are we talking about here? I'm glad you asked. In this particular study, participants were asked to read text presented on a 9.7-inch tablet and a sheet of paper for 15 minutes. The study found that their blink rates decreased significantly under both reading conditions, and there was a gradual increase in discomfort, in discomfort every five minutes during both types of reading. Long story short, this means... Looking at shit, either on paper or on your phone, decreases your number of blinks, and thus the distribution of tear film that keeps your eyeballs nice and moist. So, this may cause dry eye, another culprit of myokemia. <clears throat> yes. Now, the Lorch was kind enough to mention, quote, there is no quick fix for an eyelid twitch once it starts. <laughs> Thanks, Lorch. That's great. Uh, but artificial tears or eye drops that lubricate the eye can help. Ideally, choose one that are choose ones that are preservative free because chemical preservatives can sometimes be irritating. You could also try massaging your eyes in the shower or covering your eyes with a damp, warm washcloth right before bed, which will help relax your eye muscles and open up the glands on the margins of the eyelids. This increases oil flow into the eyes and slows down tear evaporation." End quote. Well, that just sounds lovely in general. <laughs> in fact, taking some me time is just a good idea overall. Maybe this twitching is your body's way of poking you into relaxation. Dr. Raj Maturi, a spokesman for the American Academy of Ophthalmology, told the New York Times it might just be a signal by your body asking you to slow the fuck down. So, my befuddled business goose, if you're experiencing a brief bout of eyelid twist and shout, it's only the stresses of the world getting to you, don't worry. Um, now, if this twitching persists longer than two to three weeks, or your eyelid completely closes with each twitch, and you're having difficulty opening that eye, or twitching starts to happen in other parts of the face, this may require medical intervention. I took a little, I took a, uh, <clears throat> I took a little meander through Bangkok Hospital's website. And uh, yeah, there are cases of spasms occurring for months, straight. And to deal with these very rare instances, everything from multiple Botox inject injections to surgical removal of the eyelid is treatment. Now, if you're like, ah, oh, shit, Jill, really? Why did you tell me this? <laughs> Can this just happen to me like out of the blue? Well, no, no, don't worry, Business Goose. There's probably a very identifiable cause in cases like these. Like, quote, previous head and face trauma, a family history of movement disorders, or neurovascular compression, as a blood vessel pushing on, the, pushing on a facial nerve leading to abnormal control over the facial muscles, <clears throat> is, yeah, it's gonna keep going, causing involuntary contractions or spasms of the eyelid and facial muscles, end quote. Ooh, so, good news. Odds are, 
If you get an eyelid twitch today, it's most likely the overwhelming crush of life. That's it. So thank you for listening, rating, subscribing, telling your friends that they're totally normal when they want to like eat someone's puppy on the street. Totally normal. Not a, not a problem. And um, eyelid twitching, it's just uh, just one of those things that happens until it's not. But don't worry about that. It's okay. And an annoying size thanks to the folks over at Airwave Media, <laughs> the podcast network to which WTI belongs. If you love this show, and you do, you'll love the other podcasts in this family. And please, stay interesting.